In December 1944, Harlan Hoffa was among 200 men in Company B's 55th Armored Infantry Battalion strung out along a bridge somewhere in Belgium when they were captured by the Germans. We'll talk with Hoffa about his experiences as a POW. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. You, you write in uh, Myth of Memory, which is your memoir of your experiences in World War II, quote, there is usually no shame, dishonor, or taint or of cowardice in being captured. It happens sometimes. On the other hand, there is no glory in being POW either. There is nothing gallant or heroic about it, and it is not the sort of thing to brag about in public forums. Could, could you tell us how you came to be a World War II uh, POW and, and what it sort of left you with in a way? It's I came to be a POW because I, um, my unit was, uh, was cut off and surrounded and uh, and it was uh, not so simple, <laughs> but at the same time, it was, uh, it was not exactly a unique experience either. And it was simply a, a, a typical ground action. Um, my division had been sent to uh, try to maintain the road open, in, open into Bastogne, which had previously been surrounded. Uh, we attack, uh, were stopped. Uh, when night fell, uh, the Germans counterattack. Uh, broke through the lines off to my right and rolled us up like a blanket. And uh, off to our, my immediate left, there were no more Americans. It was uh, simply uh, the, the, literally the end of the line and figuratively the end of the line as well. You were a, a young man of 19, untested in battle. You had just witnessed and been part of uh, a four-day uh, campaign that started with a thousand men and by the time of your capture was reduced to what, 200? Well, at the, end of the, at the end of that four days, I was actually captured at the end of the first day. Um, and there were 18 of us captured at the time I was captured. Um, and, uh, but at the end of that four days, uh, I had been told that there were only 200 who were, uh, who were fit to go back into the line again. We were relieved by another division, went back and reorganized and they gave them hot food and, and uh, and for maybe some clean clothes and, and, and a little rest up period. And then they were back into action again. And my division ended up as one of the spearheads of uh, Patton's army, heading all the way across to Germany into, into Czechoslovakia. What was the POW experience like? What happened when they rolled you up and moved you out? It was utter confusion. Nobody knew what was happening, uh, what had happened, how it had happened. Uh, what we could have done differently, you know, what we should have done differently. There was a, in a sense, a, um, a certain amount of was terror to begin with, um, uh, because we didn't know whether we were going to be shot or not. They lined us up against the stone wall at one point, and we figured that was that was the end of it. And this is after we'd already been machine gunned once. Um, but it's uh, utter confusion, and I think it's. Uh, It simply lacks any kind of. Uh, it's difficult to put in, put into words how you felt at that point because it was so totally different from any experience that either we'd ever had or that we'd ever been trained for. You know, we were trained to do everything from digging holes to shooting rifles and and climbing in and out of half tracks and all the rest of it. Uh, but we, nobody ever told us how to be a prisoner. Yeah, nobody ever told you beyond saying, you know, name, rank, and serial number, what to do. You, you were in a foxhole in bitter, freezing January uh, weather uh, with two canteens of water that were now ice, mm. and you hadn't eaten in 36 hours or mm. more. What, what happened when, where did they take you? They took us down a hill, um, and, and uh, after going partly by foot and partly by an old truck that they'd, that they'd come up with, I put us in a barn, an old, a stone barn that was attached to a house. And this was New Year's Eve, although I didn't remember it at that point. Um, and uh, we were asleep in this barn, or more or less asleep. Uh, you know, everybody saying to the other guy, what happened? And all of a sudden the door burst open from the adjoining house, and a light flooded in, and a German officer was standing in the doorway. 
with a compliant young lady on one arm and a bottle of brandy on the other and said, uh, Happy New Year, American soldiers. And uh, then the door slammed and, I, and uh, the next morning we were moved on somewhere else. Um, at that point we were joined by a, a fighter pilot who had been shot down. He still had creases in his pants, he smelled like aftershave. Yeah, we were muddy and dirty and, uh, and still pretty traumatized. Um, and he wouldn't give us a time of day. He, th he must have thought we were the, the dregs of the world. But uh, it was totally different. his capture and, and his appearance after capture was totally different from, from the rest of ours. By and large, however, enlisted uh, prisoners were kept separate from officers. And Air Force uh, prisoners were kept separate from ground forces. So we were, uh, and I was moved back into a, through a series of work camps in the town of uh, Prum, and then the town of Gerolstein, and then the town of Flamersheim, all of which were still west of the Rhine. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. And then to a, uh, uh, a hospital camp up near Cologne, because one of the prisoners had died and the Germans thought he was, had died of uh, diphtheria, and they were afraid of an epidemic. And we, uh, we did have a shower there. No Your first. No soap and cold water. And we put back on our, put our old dirty clothes right back on again, so I'm not sure it mattered very much. We were loaded into uh, boxcars again. Incidentally, on the march up to that camp, we marched 65 kilometers one day, which is 40 miles. It's a long walk when in your best of shape, and we were not in the best of shape. And then 12 days and locked in a boxcar. And finally got to a prison camp at Limburg, which was, uh, Limburg is about straight east of, uh, of Koblenz. And that was a real prison camp instead of a work camp with barbed wire and, and Russian compounds and French compounds and British compounds. I was there for about three weeks. In the meantime, the Americans had, had captured the bridge at Remagen and were heading in our direction. So the Germans evacuated the camp with, uh, I think as I wrote, full Teutonic fury with dogs and lots of yelling and so forth. And they put us back into boxcars again, uh, started down the road, and pulled into a tunnel for, and sat there for 36 hours. Um, came out of the tunnel, and they opened the cars one at a time to go down to a stream to wash our faces in, in muddy water. If you're upstream, you're in great shape. If you're downstream, you've got nothing but mud. And, uh, but that, and then I was back in the car at that point when uh, three American planes came over and shot up the train. Not killed, realizing POWs. Not realizing we were POWs. And uh, we made a big uh, human signboard out in the field on that uh, somebody in the outfit must have been a director of a band somewhere. And uh, so we made a POW sign. And eventually the planes got the message and uh, flew off. But they destroyed the tracks, we were told, so the train couldn't go either, either direction. So we sat around for a couple of days, uh, waiting, and doing nothing, and basking in the in the in the springtime sunshine. And they again moved us out um, again at night. Um, doors rattle in the car. You can hear the you know, freight car doors banging. And they, I think I, the word I used, they swept the cars clean with yellow brooms of lantern light, and uh, and then. Uh, we started marching again, and uh, the uh, there were people along the, in the column who couldn't simply couldn't go any further, and they were collapsing. And when somebody collapsed, and the column would stop, and uh, they dragged whoever it was off into a ditch. And there was another column coming up behind us, <coughs> supposedly, and uh, picking these people up. Um, I had escaped twice before, been recaptured, and uh, somebody collapsed behind me, and the column stopped. And I'd, every time the column stopped, I squat down on my haunches to take whatever rest I could. Um, and when I stood up, I'd black out. And I'd have to put my head down between my knees to get a little blood circulating back into my, my brain again. 
And in the meantime, we were taking, going further and further in the wrong direction, as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. And so I uh, decided it was time for me to do a header into the concrete. And so I faked a collapse. They tossed me in the ditch alongside the other guy, and we got back to the American lines a little you, while later. You, you referred to it as the not so great escape, because of course at the time, you had no way of knowing what would happen to that column of men you were no, marching I didn't. with. <laughs> However, yeah, you, 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 that's a good lead in line because the, uh, that column was intercepted by an American tank force the next morning. It took me another day and a half to get back. So I would have been better off in one sense if I'd stayed with them. In another sense, however, I think I was better off by, uh, by going back through the regular medical evacuation system because there were just two of us rather than a thousand. What the point illustrates, though, in a way, is something you said to me earlier, and that is you, d you can't anticipate what kind of a soldier you're going to be or what you're going to do in, in some of these situations, right. and you were an opportunistic uh, escapee. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I've, I've joked sometimes, I mean, why did you escape if I didn't like the food? <laughs> you were 108 pounds at this point. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, but I, I didn't know it. Uh, I just knew that my clothes weren't fitting very well anymore. Um, and uh, it was the same clothing I've been wearing ever since I've been captured and before while I was, uh, before we went into action. And I could, could have pulled my socks on from either end. Uh, my, all of my clothing was full of lice. Um, and the, uh, uh, it was dirty. I had no soap, no razor, no toothbrush. God knows no deodorant. Um, and we're, we'll, we have to stop, but you'll be back, I'm pleased to say. We'll be back with Harlan Hoffa with his story about retracing his World War II footsteps. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. Harlan Hoffa is a former World War II POW. In 1978, he and his wife went to Bastogne to revisit some of his World War II haunts. Thanks so much for joining us. You and your wife made the trip to Bastogne, Germany in, in 1978, 34 years after being captured by the Germans. Why was it important for you to go back? I think, uh, it's a, in one word, catharsis, to clean the mental attic, to get it out of my system, partly curiosity. Um, I'd been there first in, uh, in the middle of the winter, and uh, when everything was uh, gray, there was, there was no color. Black it wasn't even black and white. It was just everything was gray. The sky was gray. The ground was gray. My complexion was gray, um, and uh, I. I think I wanted to, uh, to purge, purge the memory. Uh, there is a certain amount of uh, guilt, shame, if you will, in, in becoming a prisoner, and uh, I just wanted to. I wanted to go back to to uh, alleviate that to to the extent that I could. Um, I think I also wanted to show my wife where I'd been. Um, because when I was a 19-year-old soldier, while well, she was three years old. And uh, so my war was, my war was my war, but for her it was history. And, uh, and uh, she, I must say she didn't all, all together understand why I wanted to go up, up that hill or through that patch of woods or, or any, any, of, any of that stuff. But, uh, in the end, was it cathartic? Yes, very much. I think. Uh, I mean, it was n never totally cathartic. You don't necessarily uh, you know, wash out all of the, uh, the memories that one has had. Um, I think part of the catharsis was these experiences before we went over. Um, where I'd done a good deal of reading about the bulge, I came to better understand what why I was where I was, and uh, I all came to understand also that where I was didn't matter a heck of a lot in the, in the total scheme of things. Um, I talked with my former commanding officer. I got some maps uh, from him. Um, I'd had a series, I had a, a first a dream at one point about going through the woods and finding a pile of bones and rags with a dog tag attached, and it turned out to be my dog tag, and then this crazy, science fiction dream of never being able to find my way out of the woods again. Um, and my wife said, that's, that's kind of fun, why don't you, why don't you write that up? I, that started it, I wrote a whole s a series of uh, vignettes of what it might be like to go back. Um, 
When we went back, I kept the journal. And the, uh, the myth of memory is a dovetailing of the, the projections of what it would be like to go back and, and, the, and the actual experience. In some instances, they were startlingly alike. Um, and other As an example. Well, um, after I'd escaped for the third time, and I came down a, uh, a farm lane, a patch of woods, and the ground had been torn up with um, German heavy equipment, tanks. You see the tank track and the treads and so forth. And they had put uh, broken boughs and branches on, uh, across their vehicles to camouflage them. Um, and it was very recent because they were still oozing resin. When I went back 34 years later, I, I found that same road and walked down it and the tractor had just gone up through the mud mm -hmm. and had left very similar kinds of chevron marks in, in, in the mud. Um, the town itself that I escaped to um, had not changed significantly. It was a lovely little town uh, with a castle on the hill and, and a stream running through the middle of it. And the bridge that I you know, walked across after I'd run into some Americans was still, was still there, guarded by a British, a German railroad guard. Mm -hmm. But let, let's back up a moment. You were captured uh, and spent three months as a prisoner of war at the uh, Ardennes campaign, which most of us know as a, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, which if you know your history, you know there were a lot of casualties and a lot of POWs, and you were one of the lucky ones. And I'm wondering, what is it that makes one soldier decide, as you did, to escape while, while others don't? I can't, I can't answer why others don't. I can only answer why I did. Um, and I did, uh, I think, out of uh, sheer frustration. Um, and uh, I we worked very hard, um, pick and shovel gangs. Um, the food was very bad. Um, we, I had drunk some bad water, and I had a bug in my system. And you looked down my throat and see daylight at the other end, probably. Um, and uh, and I was 19, yeah, and I and I was full of beans and and uh, wasn't about to uh, uh, be pushed around you any, were any more than I had to. I was I was an angry young man, yeah, and uh, to some extent, I guess my anger was one of the things that that uh, kept me alive. You know, if you if you didn't maintain an emotional edge. If you didn't keep your, you know, your emotions kind of at the forefront, then the system would beat you. And I, I wasn't about to let the system beat me. And, uh, and so I took matters into my own hands when I could. Um, and uh, but I, I was an opportunist. I didn't plan very far ahead. Uh, when the opportunity came, I, I took it. And if it didn't work out, well, I sort of shrugged my shoulders and. They threw me back into another uh, uh, another work camp somewhere and, and pick up my shovel and go off to unloading coal or, or working in a German bakery or whatever. But uh, I was uh, it's pretty pugnacious, and and uh, I didn't I, I don't think my I wasn't uh, a particularly aggressive person uh, either in training or or in my in my former life in, in school. Um, but I certainly became that way. You, you, and and much of your unit was was untested in battle. Right. Actually, totally. Give, give us an idea of of the casualties that you yourself witnessed in the in the short time that that uh, before you were captured. Um, if you've seen Private the uh, the Private Ryan Saving movie, Private Ryan, um, it was not at all that that vivid. Um, first place, we were much more spread out. The, the distances were much greater. If you're doing a camera shot, you have to have everybody <laughs> grouped up. But in, in real war, well, that's not the way you spread out. Uh, so you see people stumble and fall. Um, but they were wearing everything they owned to try to stay warm, so the, the blood often didn't come through. Um, the, Closest casualty to me was a before we were captured was a guy in the next foxhole, and a shell hit between us, and it wounded him uh, painfully. And uh, I 
dragged and grabbed him by the coat collar and skidded him back down the hill and uh, and but and he uh, he was wounded somewhat uh, slightly in the head but more seriously in the leg the shrapnel wounds um, after we were captured uh, we were machine gunned and they killed one person and wounded two others um, overall uh, my unit uh, suffered uh, there were 200 out of 1,000 that were still combat effective at the end of the four days before we were relieved. Um, there were 18 of us captured, and, and uh, many of those were, uh, after they rested up, with when they went back into action again. But there were, at the end of the war, there were six out of 250 who had, not, who had been in, in combat from the first day until the end of the war. Uh, the others had, in, some, of course, had been, had been killed and, and some seriously wounded, so they never went back. Uh, others were slightly of wounded, so they never went back into action, but they had other duties. Uh, the man who was cap wounded the day I was captured uh, right next to me ended up driving a Jeep <laughs> in La Havre in France. You, you write in, in Myth of Memory um, about uh, going back to Germany and spending three weeks uh, camping, and you talk about a neighboring trailer with two Belgian couples, and one of the men saying to you, Thank you for fighting for us. And that comment you said uh, surprised, touched, and even embarrassed you. I had done very little <laughs> to, to save him. Uh, I had to assume that he was speaking to me in a generic sense and not, certainly not in a personal sense. But nonetheless, the, uh, I was very touched by the, by the expression of gratitude that was expressed toward uh, those who had, who had come in, and they'd had some very rough times in Belgium and Holland and in France uh, during the war, little food, uh, badly oppressed. Um, and uh, so when he, after an evening of uh, libations, <laughs> um, he slung an arm across my shoulder and said, we thank you, and I, I kind of teared up. It was. I may be doing it now, <laughs> and just in thinking about it. But uh, no, it's a, it was an emotional ex moment, um, one that I uh, look back on, I guess warmly, but but somewhat embarrassed in somewhat an embarrassed fashion also. You wrote before and after your visit what what a book, a spiral bound book mm -hmm. entitled Myth of Memory, and I wonder why you refer to it as sort of. Uh, a fictional history. You use the word myth of memory, and in many respects, isn't this the real history? Myth is truth, as far as I'm concerned. Now, if I, I draw a difference between truth and fact, and and uh, so and, uh, what I tried to do was to capture the the truth of, of an event, uh, as most myths historically uh, and, and in most literature capture the truth of events or the truth of human relationships and, and that sort of thing. The truth of your memory of it. Yeah, exactly. Rather than purely reciting the facts of it. So the, that, I think that's why I use the word the, the myth of memory. It was based on memory, but trying to, uh, to do so in a way that went, went simply beyond the factual recitation of uh, dates and places and, and that sort of thing. We have just a couple of seconds remaining. Um, to read it is to, to have feel in some parts as though we were in your shoes. And I'm wondering how emotional it was a, a job or a chore to write the myth of memory. I loved it. <laughs> it, was, it, was not, it was not a chore at all. It was a, uh, uh, I, I, truly, I truly enjoyed uh, uh, cleaning my attic, if you will. And on that note, we're out of time. Thanks so much for being with yeah, us. Pleasure. Our guest has been Harlan Hoffa, who was uh, a POW in World War II. For Take Note, I'm Patty Satalia. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.